friends. Uh, my name is May Eloar, and I'm a core faculty at CIS in the Women's Spirituality Program right now. And it really is my honor to be the chair of uh, Audra's dissertation. Um, I would like to also uh, welcome and introduce the other committee members. We have Dr. Heidi Frazier Hagman with us. And we also have where, Dr. Serena Pellarolo with us. If you can just um, wave so everybody knows who you are. And I don't want to take too much time. I want to turn it over to Heidi, the, uh, to, sorry, to Audra. The agenda for today is that Audra will present on her dissertation. And then the three members of her committee will have some rounds of appreciations, reflections, comments. Then we'll open it up for you know, public questions and comments. The committee will go into a breakout session to discuss the defense and then come back and let Audra know what the decision has been. So the whole process should take about an hour and a half to two hours in between that. So uh, sit back, enjoy. You'll get a chance to ask questions at the end. And I'm going to turn it over to Audra, whose dissertation title is The Journey of Women Leaders in Higher Education, an Analysis of Narratives of Women Overcoming Bias and Adversity. So go ahead, Audra. Thank you. Um, and I just want to add on to the timing. I know some of you have work in class at one o'clock and you're going to jump off and I appreciate you so much for being here. So feel free. It's not going to bother me if people come and go if you need to leave. Um, and my presentation should be complete before the hour. Um, so let me just take a moment to share my screen. Shake out my jitters. All right. You can all see that. Great. I'm going to pull you over here. Um, and May, you're the first person on my thing. So if anything goes on, I'm going to look at you to tell me what to do. <laughs> all right. Well, hello. Thank you all for being here. Welcome to my dissertation defense. I am really excited to be sharing my work with you today um, on the journey of women in leadership in higher education. Um, and I have a few thank yous to do, um, but I wanna just share, most of you know me um, already, but a few notes about myself and my background um, and my email, you are welcome to contact me um, if you want any of the information that I share, references, um, data, if I can help you. I know there are some other uh, doctoral students and candidates on the call today. So I have a BA in sociology and studio art and an MS in organizational management. Um, and I'm a candidate in East-West psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies. I'm also now officially adjunct faculty at Sonoma State along with being the director of Upward Bound for Lake and Mendocino. And I saw my boss Susan jump on, so thank you for being here. Um, I'll be teaching a class this fall. Um, the, my first official solo uh, course, I'll be leading the senior project for our human development seniors at Sonoma State. So excited about that. Um, I want to, before I jump in, really just thank everyone that's on the call and everyone else that is sort of in the ether supporting me. Um, it truly, truly takes a village to get a doctoral student to this place in time. Um, and all of you on the call have been a part of my village. I'm so grateful for each of you. Um, a special thank you to my peers, Sasha, Virginia, and David that are on here. We've been in a, a dissertation group for five years. Um, so thank you so much. Also my colleagues, friends, and family that are here and on the journey with me the last eight years. Um, hmm. And my husband, Rick, of course. Um, for everything we're creating together. I thought I wasn't going to cry. <laughs> um, but all of the times that you have taken the lead to allow me to do this work. Thank you so much. Um, and to my committee, uh, without you, I may really not be standing here today. Um, your steadfast support, encouragement, your critical feedback has truly made the difference. Each of you is an example of a woman that's supporting women. 
um, lifting each other up, supporting each other. Um, I chose each one of you specifically because of your own commitment to leadership, to feminism, and to um, your academic rigor and the practical application of this in the world. Um, so thank you so much, Serena, for being uh, a midwife for me in this process, for Heidi, your attention to detail and your constant invitation for me to go deeper as a writer and a scholar. And um, May, you took me under your wing and you've really helped to usher in the feminist in me. Uh, with your support, I not only turned the whole tide of my dissertation proposal, but I was able to get to this finish line. So I really appreciate each of you and thank you so much for being here today. Also, just a moment to dedicate this work to my daughter, Julia, and all the women in my family. Um, my mom, my aunt Sheila, my cousin Sonia are all on the call today, and Sonia's daughters, my nieces, Felicia, Aliyah, and Eleanor. Um, this work is really about our lineage and the world that I seek where everyone can thrive, um, regardless of the color of our skin, the fortune of our family, or the world that we grew up in, we can change the world in front of us. And I dream of a day where any of these young women could be president of this nation if they chose to. And a quick land acknowledgement to the people of the Narragansett where I was born, the people of the Penobscot where I grew up, and the people of the Coast Miwok and Pomo villages here in Sonoma County. Um, on the northern coast of California. I'm gonna just take a drink of water before I dive in. All right, so this is an agenda for today. Um, it doesn't include every single nuance that we're gonna go through, but just to give you a brief overview of uh, what you're gonna learn today. So first I'm gonna introduce the problem of my work and the need for this work. I'm gonna share my research question, the purpose and objectives. I'm gonna share a brief overview of the findings before I dive into the unique qualitative framework that I used, share with you the design of my study, the data collection and analysis I went through, the findings that I came to, um, specifically four themes of strategy and influence that these women um, sort of illuminated for me. I'm gonna share strengths and limitations of the work um, next steps, recommendations, and suggestions for leaders, women in higher education, um, but also administrators in higher education, and then a summary and significance of the work at the end. Um, and feel free, I can't see the chat right now, so it's not going to bother me, but if you have questions about anything, you could put it in the chat, and that way I'll be able to save it, and when the committee goes to deliberate, they're going to step out for 15 minutes, then I can um, try to respond to some of those. Um, and you're welcome to ask them later as well. So let's get into the meat of it. So the problem. Right now, um, in our last survey of college presidents in 2018, we can see that roughly 30% of university presidents are women. And less than 5% of them are women of color. So this is from the American Council on Higher Education. They do um, a semi-annual survey of college presidents. And this percentage is actually up um, just slightly from 2011. Um, it went up about 3.9% in just you know, under a decade. Um, but if we continue on that same annual growth rate, which we may or may not, we'll have to see, um, we wouldn't reach gender parity in the pres presidency until 2030. However, we won't know exactly what the numbers of women of color are in those positions. And so we really have a lot of work to do. And I don't believe that it has to be this way. Um, today, more women actually earn doctoral degrees than men, and yet less of them achieve full professor rank, director positions, administrator positions, and still across the board, all staff and faculty in higher education in our nation, um, and in many other industries, women are still paid 80 cents to every dollar that a man makes. So that's 20% less than men. Um, that can equal approximately $10,000 plus dollars per year, um, but if we look at the spectrum of that, that means women are losing millions of dollars. Um, and we know that women are the, you know, often making the decisions in the home about purchases and how to spend money, and so this dramatically impacts our economy, um, and uh, more so the patriarchal structures that are still in place, and we're going to talk more about that. 
So um, despite the extensive literature on women in leadership and the acknowledgement and awareness of different types of adversity that women are experiencing, um, we still have not been able to close the gender gap. And so that's, that's the big issue that we're focused on. Universities specifically are gendered organizations and they're nested within a gendered hierarchy. So we still see that the highest prestige institutions, paying, highest paying disciplines and the most influential positions are all male dominated. And that's across the whole sort of industry of higher education. Um, some institutions are very different from that. Um, specifically the one I'm at, Sonoma State, has many women in leadership. Um, so we do see that it can change and be different, um, but still today we see this gender gap. So what holds women back? Um, this reality is realized through um, commonly what's known as the glass ceiling. Um, but actually there's more recent literature that talks about the labyrinth. The glass ceiling idea is that a woman could actually sort of reach the top and punch through that glass, break through, they've made it to this position of senior leadership or power and influence in their company or organization. Um, and that's that, they're good. Well, not true. Um, and my participants really shared that um, in progressing through the institutions that they had that ha held leadership positions in, um, they actually felt more bi bias and adversity as they went up in leadership. Um, so the idea of the labyrinth is that it's a maze versus a box. And that maze has twists and turns and it's a constant navigation. Um, so, you know, we've seen with the uprising of Black Lives Matter that um, people of color still are in this tight woven system where everything is locked in and oppression is still very real for them. Um, it's very similar for all women, but specifically women of color are going to experience more of these things. Um, and that labyrinth is sometimes um, very nuanced. Um, sometimes things are happening to them that are really egregious or violent. Um, and I'm not going to share too many of the direct um, experiences of participants today. I'm really focused on anonymity for them. Um, but to know that women, it's, it's not just that they're experiencing adversity. They're experiencing um, direct sexism, racism, ageism, classism, um, and more. And I'll share about that. Um, in this uh, sort of realm of bias that they're experiencing, there's also something called secondary bias. And that can be much more subtle and indirect and leave women with the feeling of um, having like a pit in their stomach, questioning themselves, wondering if, did that just happen to me? Um, I'm not sure if that was bias or not, but when you get that feeling and the little hairs are tingling on the back of your neck, um, often there is some sort of bias that is being encountered um, and women are, are often experiencing that in their work. There's also a lack of formal and informal mentorship. So some mentorship exists and mentorship was a big part of the women that I interviewed experience, um, but there's a lack of it um, across the board and a lack of formal training and leadership development for women in higher education. So why is it this way still? Um, well, for my work and the viewpoint that I um, came to this dissertation with and the research, um, it's really centered around a feminist constructive viewpoint. So that viewpoint attributes women's leadership styles to the way that they've actually been gendered by our society through a myriad of nuanced and interwoven social, cultural, historical, and personal constructions. So this is a versus, versus an essentialist view that would say women are born this way and this is how they should be based on their gender, based on their sex. Um, when we look from a, a more non-binary uh, non perspective or from this constructivist view, we see that this is actually built into our system, into our families and our cultures and then passed on to women. Um, so it can include things like familial influences, the cultural environment that someone is in, their geographic location, their social context, their uh, social class, um, and any history of bias and adversity that they may have experienced or trauma that they may have experienced. So the purpose of this dissertation inquiry was really to explore narratives of women leaders in higher education. 
um, who have overcome adversity and bias in order to sort of achieve the positions of senior leadership that they're in, but also that they've cultivated this capacity for personal re resilience. And I wanted to know how did they do this? So not just that they're up against bias and adversity, the, the scholarship and literature is really clear that that is already um, obvious, right? It takes place. Um, but how do they overcome that? I even had women as I was interviewing them say, um, you keep saying overcome and I'm not sure that I have. And my response was, well, you're in this position of leadership as a vice president. And there are other women that aren't, that might want to be, um, and are not able to overcome the adversity that they're up against and the bias that's inherent in the structures of these institutions. And so I do see that you've overcome this to some certain extent. And while it may not feel like that personally um, in your reality, the, the way that you've been able to move through the organization is, is not accessible to everyone. So what practices and strategies were they employing in this process of being able to overcome the bias and adversity to some extent, to some degree in their lives? Um, and I did learn a lot about what practices they used and I'm gonna share that with you. I also wanted to gain this knowledge um, to potentially establish more formal leadership programming. Um, some of that exists for women in higher education, but it's sort of here and there in little pockets and not everybody has access to it. It can be very expensive um, and it can be very selective where institutions have to pay, you know, upwards of $10,000 to send women to programs. Um, so making this more accessible, more um, wide open to women in higher education, especially those who are at entry or mid-level and want to continue on. So my research question, what do narratives shared by women leaders in higher education contribute towards a greater understanding of the adversity and bias that women leaders encounter on their journey? and what practices and measures might actually enhance their capacity for resilience. Here's your sneak peek. This is a little bit of the overview of the findings that um, came out of the research. And then we're gonna dive into this more after you hear about my study and sort of the framework that it came from. So we know that women still experience outright and direct bias along with secondary bias as they navigate through this organizational labyrinth. Um, Self-care and self-preservation were the primary ways that they cultivated resilience um, and supported themselves along with advancing their career um, with the support of mentors. So we're gonna talk about those key people that helped them um, get to where they're at. They engage others through collective and collaborative leadership. They pay it forward by mentoring others and they really place justice and equity at the center of their work as leaders in higher education. And as leaders, they engage feminist, eco-feminist and transformative leadership principles in their work. And I'm gonna explain all of those things, um, but they wouldn't necessarily say, I'm a feminist in my work but when questioned about it and discussing it, they realized, oh yeah, like these things that I do are feminist and they are transformative. Um, and hmm, interesting, I am a feminist leader. They would sort of come to that realization during the, the work and the interview that we did together. I say the work because it's truly a relationship and a partnership, I'm gonna talk more about that. Um, finally, they really wanna make impact and lead change for the greater good. So these women are working towards leaving a legacy for those who come uh, behind them. So the qualitative framework that I used in this study was feminist, eco-feminist and transformative leadership. I'm gonna share what each of those are for you. So feminism first um, is multidimensional and from diverse perspectives. It is informed by intersectionality of identity and people's lives. It is um, informed as a critical scholarship and it has a commitment to social justice. It is centered around gender-based inequity, um, but really focuses on all inequity that all people should have access and agency. Um, adding to this, Gloria Anseldua specifically adds that feminism is about fighting against the diminishment of humanness. 
So it's not just about gender. It's, you know, at the very bottom baseline of this, it's about being human and that everyone that's human should have access and agency in their lives um, and not be diminished. Um, and then just adding to that one more specific thing is that gender difference um, is actually an essential part of any discussion of our social or symbolic world. It's always there. Um, and it's involved really in, in every discipline that we see in academia. Ecofeminism is encompassing all these ideals of feminism, but it also um, sees that the Western industrial civilization that we have today is really in opposition to nature. And that opposition actually reinforces the subjugation of women. Um, Ecofeminism really believes that life on earth is truly an interconnected web. It's not a hierarchy where someone at the top is telling everyone at the bottom how to do it. Everything feeds into everything and, and is connected to each other. And in this sort of ecosystem model, a healthy ecosystem really must maintain diversity to be flourishing and oppose violence. And the actual survival of humanity depends on this renewed understanding of nature and how it applies to women and gender difference. Transformative leadership is um, taking leadership a few steps further, and it really believes that leadership is about change, but that everybody could be a leader if they wanted to be, and that they are um, in their own right. Um, everyone that leads is a change agent. Change and leadership go hand in hand. Um, leadership is also shared. It's not just one person telling somebody else what to do. Um, and the purpose of leadership is truly to support people to grow, to support communities to grow, to thrive and create harmony amongst people and with nature. So there's this goal in transformative leadership of truly creating sustainability for future generations um, through community care and shared responsibility. And a lot of what I'm saying here in the transformative leadership bucket is things that I saw the women participants really speak to in my study. Um, and finally, in all of these um, theories, each person matters. Each person's welfare and dignity is respected and honored. So all of these really are about a collaborative shared purpose of humanity, that leadership is shared, that it can be collective, um, and that it is all focused on um, continuing to uphold humanity and nature together and thrive. Um, I looked through this lens and um, was able to use this to deconstruct what we might call, um, Hooks has called, Bell Hooks, has called the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. So in the beginning of my work, I was really just focused on patriarchy, but as it unfolded and expanded and I worked with my committee on this, it became really clear that it's, it's not just the patriarchy, right? And Bell Hooks has um, really done a good job in explaining how these uh, three components are actually pretty much one, right? They're interwoven and connected to each other and they're tangled in in a way that they cannot be unhooked just simply, right? It will take a lot of intention to do that. So right now, our dominant culture and structures of our social systems truly still rest upon this uh, white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Um, so that's racism, materialism, and sexism. And that means it's all within the roots of everything we do in the organizations that we are a part of. Um, so I wanted to share just one thing that Hooks says about this in relationship to higher education. So she says, if we examine critically the traditional role of the university in the pursuit of truth and the sharing of knowledge and information, it is painfully clear that biases that uphold and maintain white supremacy, imperialism, sexism, and racism have distorted education. So it is no longer about the practice of freedom. The call for a recognition of cultural diversity, a rethinking of the ways of knowing, a deconstruction of old epistemologies is here. There must be a transformation in our classrooms, in how we teach, in what we teach, as a necessary evolution, and one that seeks to restore life to a corrupt and dying academy. 
So I believe this work truly um, and directly translates to administration of higher education and how we're leading our organizations. So within as without, what we teach and how we lead in our universities is intricately woven together with these systems and oppressive systems that still are with us today. So a bit about the design of uh, my study. So this was a qualitative study. It was narrative in nature. So I used narrative methodology, um, which is directly against the sort of patriarchal and egalitarian structures that we've been talking about. Um, and approaches of more traditional methods of quantitative research. Not to say all quantitative methods are inegalitarian. Um, and actually, I think that a qualitative, or excuse me, a quantitative component could have added to what I learned qualitatively about my participants. I think there's ways to do it. Um, but narrative methodology, specifically when working with women, allows for the arising of their story and their lived experience. So I conducted semi-formal narrative interviews with eight participants, and these semi-formal narrative interviews allowed for relationship and a flow of questioning and answering and discussion between myself and my, my participant or co-researcher, and also was informed and allowed for a feminist standpoint um, to be interwoven into this methodology. Um, as I mentioned, story was at the center of this. So this was really about understanding the lived experience of women um, as a necessary constituent of knowledge formation. So a telling of their own history, their own consciousness, and their own perceived reality as a co-researcher in the process. I utilized open-ended questions and then analyzed the responses thematically. And I was approved for this research to ensure the ethics and integrity of the research um, because I was working with human subjects through the HRRC at CIIS, um, which is our Human Research Review Committee, um, which people might know as an IRB or Institutional Review Board at other institutions. So a little bit about the types of narratives that center women um, that I brought into my research and my literature review. I specifically looked at biographical, um, where someone might talk about themselves, uh, or excuse me, somebody else might talk about them, and autobiographical, where they talk about themselves. Um, and these women who are border crossers that talk about the stories of other women in relationship to their own story and ethnography. Um, and they might actually sort of uh, touch the boundaries of what exists currently in the research canon um, and do things that are sort of out of the box or out of the ordinary um, in sharing their own bias and adversity that they've been up against. Um, I positioned myself as a researcher amongst the literature from an analytical and intuitive perspective. That's from uh, or excuse me, and then the subjective and interpretive. So let me just break down those a little bit. Um, I did a thematic analysis of the work. I was analytical in approaching the stories that I learned from women, but I was also doing this from an intuitive perspective and intuitive and subjective sort of can go hand in hand. Um, at times my intuition might've said, oh, ask a little bit more there, go a little bit deeper or sit back and be quiet and let them reflect. So following my own intuitive process through the uh, interviews with the women, but also uh, really recognizing that this work is subjective, right? Often you'll hear that research has to be objective and I would argue that it really can't be. Um, it's almost impossible to be completely objective and subjectivity is inherent to research. Um, to deny that would be faulty. And it allows us to actually interpret experiences through the relationships that we have with one another. Um, so I also had some considerations in addition to these sort of positions that I was trying to take, um, which was feminist leadership. Um, and we talked, you know, that was a specific question that I had for the women participants. We talked a lot about what that means and some of them realized like, yes, I am a feminist leader. Um, that this could be transformative in its own process, the interviews and then the process of analyzing the interviews, um, both transformative for the participants themselves and for me as the researcher, for all of you potentially hearing this um, research and the findings. Um, and then on to those who will read it in the future. 
I also tried to come from a perspective of mindfulness, bringing in my own practices, um, body-based practices, yoga, meditation, being with the earth myself, um, lighting a candle, getting centered before I met with them, um, sometimes doing that before I dove into the work uh, of writing. And, and then sometimes you're, you're writing in between meetings, so that happens too, but overall try to incorporate that. So the lives of women, their stories, their narratives are truly rich and nuanced. And what that revealed to me as a resilient intersection of their identities and their values. I've shared a bit about how I approached the work, but I just also wanted to enter in some of my positionality personally as a researcher, because I am also an administrator and leader in higher education. Um, I come from an interdisciplinary approach. I have a background as a coach and a systems thinker. And so all of this contributes to the, the overall academic portions of what I'm doing. Um, and I wanted to stay reflexive while acknowledging my own subjectivity and my own beliefs um, and, and then bring in that mindfulness, but also self-care. Um, I just became a mother recently. So this whole process is sort of interwoven in my own life um, and my own spiritual tending. Um, and my own locus of control, right? What can I actually control, influence, um, and impact in this um, time that I'm doing this work while I'm also working full-time and mothering full-time? So a little bit about the roles and demographics of my participants. I used interviews from eight women participants. They were at six institutions of higher education. I found them through personal connections, referrals, introductions, um, and mostly was in touch with them via email or working with their assistants. Um, seven of them were at four-year institutions and one was at a community college. I used eight Zoom uh, video recordings. One of them was through Zoom, but audio only. Um, and I had one participant that I interviewed and then was disqualified um, because when COVID happened, um, I lost an interview in the, in the ethers somewhere of the internet. Um, and to go back and redo that wouldn't really be ethical and in integrity with the work. It would um, shape the interview and the outcomes differently. Um, and there's a little bit about their race and ethnicity here. Um, six of the women out of the eight were women of color. And this is a diagram of their positions um, at their institutions. We had several presidents, provosts, vice presidents, um, or AVP positions, or some sort of equivalent of that. Um, some notes about my data collection. As I mentioned, I used Zoom. So I conducted the actual interview through the Zoom video platform and then recorded our voices and our, our video, our audio. Um, but it also recorded the transcript text, which is then um, transferred into a VTT file. So I worked with uh, a system to translate that file into a document that could be used. Um, through my research review process with the HRRC, um, I actually brought on a transcriber, had them sign a confidentiality waiver. Um, so Zoom did like 60% of the work, the transcriber did another 30%. I went back in, reviewed everything, um, and made final changes, and then shared it with the participants themselves who reviewed their own transcripts. Um, and some of them did make small minor changes. I used a semi-structured interview guide, as I mentioned. I had 12 questions um, and I followed strict anonymity protocols for um, my participants as they're high profile leaders and in institutions that people might be aware of. So this is um, an image, a word cloud of some of the things that sort of rose to the top. If you wanna think about like the cream that came right to the top of the milk, um, these are the things that when we look at the words and the phrases that they use were most commonly used in the interviews. Resilience came up over and over, um, bias and adversity, of course, the use of the word woman um, or women talking about themselves, talking about other women and what they've experienced. And then a lot about positionality, the university, the institution, the CEO, the dean, the president, um, the other people that they worked with, the staff, the faculty, the students, talking about women of color in those um, roles, um, the importance of leadership and education and um, mentors and sponsors. 
This came out of my data analysis. Um, I first did manual coding, pen on paper, printed everything out, read it in my hammock chair out in my backyard, sort of got into the interview again and really just felt into what was important about what they said. And through that process, five critical questions and their associated responses arose, um, specifically around questions like, how do you describe yourself as a leader? Um, what would you consider to be feminist leadership? And do you consider yourself a feminist leader? Have you experienced adversity and bias? What are some of those experiences? How do you feel you've overcome the adversity and bias that you've experienced? And what supported you to overcome these challenges? Specifically, do you have any personal practices of self-care? I used some systems to then triangulate what I found through that manual process. So um, the previous word cloud you saw was through word counting that I did through a system called Kenneth Counter. Um, and then I created the word art later. And I also use a, a system called Atlas TI where I was able to um, manually and then some automated systems of coding the participant transcripts and responses, focusing specifically on those critical questions and responses. Here's an overview of what I found. I mentioned to you my four themes of strategy and influence. Um, and these four strategies and four themes really came about um, in relationship to the stakeholders that they're in connection to within their institution, the environment of the institutions that they have been leaders within, their positionality now and in the past, and the relationships that they have with one another um, or other people within the institution and other leaders. Um, so the four themes are what women are up against, it was very clear they shared a lot of that bias and adversity um, and they fall into certain buckets, which I'll describe, um, how they overcame that bias and adversity, how they engage others as a leader and in this process, and then how they move forward and actively choose to move forward from these experiences. I am noticing just in the moment that my next slide is incorrect, so I'm just going to skip. Oh, no. For some reason, it came up wrong. Um, no, it's correct. OK, what are they up against? So um, women are clearly still up against bias and adversity. Um, that included sexism, racism, ageism, classism. And they shared very specific and egregious examples of that in some cases. It also includes motherhood and caretaking, um, that they're not only caretaking for their children and their families, but their, their elders, their parents, their communities, especially for women of color, and their gender expression. How do they overcome that? Through resilience and the cultivation of that resilience in their lives, which was directly connected to their personal care practices. So they all talked about self-care as a top priority, um, trying to find balance within their high demanding jobs and um, what was sort of expected of them and what they wanted to focus on in their own lives. Um, and sometimes noticing that they were working too much for too long, for too many years and shifting that perspective, wanting to work less, find more balance, more ease in their lives um, or balancing it with kids and caretaking at home. Um, there were certain practices that they all discussed and that sort of arose as really key things for them. Exercise was a big one. They all talked about moving and working with their body um, and exercising um, in lots of different ways. It could be going for a run or going to the gym or swimming or hiking on their vacations. Um, it could be as simple as walking in nature. Um, but it was critical for all of them on a regular basis, not a once in a while thing. Many of them discussed their faith and their spirituality and within that prayer and meditation, um, even those who didn't talk about faith specifically talked about meditation as a practice for themselves. So that mindfulness piece comes in and nature came into many of the responses that they shared. Specifically nature came in um, as a, a respite, a place for them to go when things were really difficult. Um, one participant, a president of an institution talked about a hate crime that she had experienced on a campus and that she needed to go just cry by a river, be with the water, 
let it sort of soak up her tears and process how that impacted her and her community. So how they engage others through collective leadership. They talked a lot about the people around them, the circle of people and support, um, just like my circle of support here today. Um, their hype squad, their power posse, their people, they used lots of different words. They got really animated about it when they described it. Um, they have their people to turn to. And specifically, they talked about this being a diverse group of people from a lot of different backgrounds. Some people in the institution, some people outside of higher education altogether, people that they had met along the way. Um, one person really dived into describing who these people were. I want white people, I want people of color, I want gay people, I want straight people, I want men and women. I want all these diverse perspectives to feed me and help me along um, when I come up against challenges and celebrations. They talked a lot about their mentors and sponsors. Many of them that were in higher level positions, VPs, presidents, they had someone along the way that helped them get a job, find a job, um, were sponsored to attend leadership programming um, like the American Council on Education. I mentioned earlier, they do this president survey. They also have a leadership program for potential future presidents. Um, so things like those types of programs, really high level stuff. They talked about collaborative and inclusive leadership, really allowing all the voices on their team and at the table to be included. And the process of making decisions that they take all this information in, they want to hear everybody's voice and give space and room to that discussion. But at the end of the day, they are responsible for decisions for the institution. And so they have to know and have with integrity um, and belief in themselves and their decision that they've done due diligence, gone through the process, and they're making a clear decision to move forward. They discussed characteristics of feminist leadership um, as I've shared a little bit. And they also talked about mentoring others and sort of paving the way and paying it forward for emerging leaders, not just women, but you know, often they wanna share with women too. So one of the participants said about this, you know, men train boys to take the place at the board table and be the big guy. And women don't train girls to do that and we need to. We need to train girls to take their place at the table and do it without apologizing and without shrinking. You are smart and you belong here and it's okay. So I wanna share just a few of the strengths and limitations of this study. Um, the strengths, I have an abundance of good data in these narratives and um, I probably wouldn't have been able to have the time to process much more than the eight interviews. Um, but there's so much more that I could do with that. I could actually analyze it in different ways. There are other possibilities um, and there are many possible future publications with this work, how I have it written now and um, potentially other things. I'll share some future research um, that is possible and for more research to be done with the same data set or similar data sets. Some of the limitations, um, COVID, I lost a potential participant who was home, homeschooling and working full time as an administrator. And I also lost that recording that I talked about of one participant. Um, I had to shorten my interviews a bit to accommodate their busy schedules. Part of that might've been COVID, part of it just that they're vice presidents and presidents of institutions. Um, and I had mentioned this in the beginning about the methodology, but I think uh, a mixed method study could have actually added to the qualitative data that was found um, by doing maybe a simple demographic survey or something like that. So recommendations that I have for women in higher education. Specifically, be well prepared, understand what women historically have experienced and are up against, be aware of the personal and systemic structures and know exactly what you're in for in the current system as it is today. Um, also to move beyond reductionist approaches and develop awareness of this interlocking system of oppression that I discussed about that emerges from white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Develop self-leadership Really focus on your strengths and build that inner compass for that decision making within your own life and your own professional um, career, but also within institutions that you're in. And learn to recognize bias and not just brush it off. A lot of that self-care, um, you know, it can help 
to a certain degree, but if we brush things off and not acknowledge them, it stays with us in our sort of somatic experience, right? And in our psyche and our spirit. Um, so it's really important to look at things that have happened um, and process that in your own life. Develop a self-care practice. And that's um, not just as an act of self-preservation, but also to stay in integrity with your values and who you're choosing to be as a leader. Um, seek to find balance, but also acknowledge grief um, and approach leadership as collective and continue to pay it forward. Some suggestions for institutions of higher education. Institutions really do have the power and agency to address this ongoing adversity that women still experience in higher education. And um, they can explicitly identify and address this labyrinth that women are in and people of color within their institution. Um, I understand how this persists, but specifically how racism persists within their organizations and how um, anti-racist and anti-patriarchal approaches could be weaved into the fabric of their institution. So then develop and implement a change plan that systemically would untangle that organizational bias and adversity from their structures, systems, policies, procedures, et cetera. Create opportunities for women to gather and support one another, have their leadership regularly participate in that process and mentor or femtor other emerging women leaders. Offer regular, I would say annual, if not more, um, leadership training opportunities for women, but from this eco-feminist transformative lens, and then identify emerging leaders and help to support them pursue further professional development off campus that could give them that leg up. Some recommendations for future research, um, further deconstructing servant leadership in higher education from this lens that I used, the trifecta of feminism, ecofeminism, and transformative leadership. Um, specifically, the women talked about having beliefs and behaviors that were sort of tied into this servant leadership um, theory as a self-preservation mechanism, but actually being um, in that sort of vein of servant leadership, um, it's sort of contributing to that experience where women can brush off these adverse experiences and try to move forward, deposition themselves as a victim, not take it on personally, and then redirect their focus back into their work. Um, from that mindset of, well, I'm going to be of service in my leadership role and not focus on myself and my own experience. But brushing that off is uh, a really dangerous thing. Um, when we brush off oppression, it can continue to weigh on us unequally as the marginalized or underrepresented um, people um, within that dominant system that I've uh, defined. So for particularly for women of color, pushing past these experiences will contribute to the extreme level of stress that they're already under. Um, and you know, just finally, before I move on, um, I just ultimately believe servant leadership is really rooted in this white supremacist capitalist patriarchal system. And servant leadership is really highly used in higher education and actually well regarded. And so I think that needs to be deconstructed. Um, there could be some really serious research on that. Um, a repeat study, simply what I did, maybe with a few refinements, but with emerging leaders that are at uh, mid-level staff and faculty uh, positions, where you can see what are they actually up against right now, right? It's one thing to know how women in leadership have overcome these things. It's another thing to know uh, what women are up against in the moment and how they might actually pursue overcoming that or navigate through that labyrinth. Um, understanding along with very popular psychology um, publications, um, how women develop resilience and grit, um, and then focus that specifically on women in higher education. And then developing a survey of women to understand how this um, trifecta I use, the feminist, ecofeminist, transformative leadership trifecta, um, how it's being used, and then how it could be integrated even further into leadership development training for women. I'm just noticing the time, so I'm speeding up a little bit, but um, I just have two more slides. So possible next steps for me, I know there were questions about this and I'm happy to share more in the question and answer, um, but I, I think that this research could be really well done on a sort of public level with a website and a quiz that women could take who are in higher education or in leadership in general, um, and then sort of do some psychoeducational spiritual work around that experience that they're going through, but also collecting more data that could be used for further research. 
Um, I also might write a book, speak, teach, lead trainings. Um, I hope to lead eco retreats for women. Um, I thought about uh, developing a course online that could be accessed publicly. Um, I really would very much like to further elucidate a change process for institutions of higher education um, and universities and possibly provide consultation on that. Um, I intend to share my recommendations with the vice president and president at Sonoma State where I work now. Um, I'd also like to envision a comprehensive leadership development program, maybe that's housed in something like a center for women's leadership, maybe within the CSU system. I don't know, we'll see where things go. Uh, but first, I might just take a break, focus on my family. So just in summary, a little bit about the significance of this work. It is all centered around access, equity, agency, and justice, not just for women, um, for all people who are underrepresented and continue to be oppressed. Um, all of our trans community, our queer community, all people of color, um, anybody who you know, is experiencing a disability, um, who doesn't have English as a first language. Um, there are so many ways that our underrepresented communities continue to be oppressed. Um, and we really need to continue to fight for them from an anti-racist and anti-oppressive lens. I also believe we have to develop trauma-informed communities of care. Uh, we've seen, we have seen some of that arise due to the political racial movements this past year within institutions, but and also due to COVID, but I don't really think it's trauma-informed. It's sort of stress-informed, um, but the root of trauma, I think we really need to focus on that as communities of cares within institutions um, to be able to heal ourselves and each other. Um, this work really outlines a process of change for higher education and could be the foundation of a lot more, as I discussed in my recommendations. Um, and all of this work continued to solidify my own interest in human development and the psychology of women and leadership, and I hope to continue to pursue that. Here are many of the references I used in the slides. You're welcome to have any of that, and any of you are welcome to read my dissertation um, now or when it's published on ProQuest. Finally, just thank you to all of you. Thank you to everyone who's contributed to this work, to each of my participants, to all of the women who have spoke and um, fought for justice. And I hope that we can really see a world where all women's lives are honored, all women's voices are heard, um, and we can all be peaceful, happy, and free. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Audra, so much. And would you like to maybe stop share and then we can see everyone? Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you everyone for being here. And I'd like us to stop and take a moment if everybody can turn their screen on, give Audra a minute to breathe and just kind of show our appreciation. If we were together, we'd be clapping right now, but what do we do on Zoom after that amazing presentation? just kind of give you a minute and really, really demonstrate our appreciation for what you just presented. Thank you so much, Audra. Thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, I'd like to start um, the committee uh, engagement with going around like in a round robin and just offering uh, a first comment as an appreciation to this work or in appreciation of this work before we open it up for questions and answers. And I'd like to invite Dr. Sirena to start, who is uh, a guest to CIS today. So um, Dr. Sirena, I'm trying to, there's all the boxes. Yes, thank you. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you. you. Start I'm with sorry. In appreciation. Of yeah. course. Yeah. I am the external member of this committee, so I was not as close as the other members um, in the birthing of this incredible dissertation, but I have been able to see several drafts and the way that you have been able to hone the focus and write such a compelling work that's so needed. Um, I was looking at the bibliography and this is really original, very unique, and you put your own personal perspective to it. It's really, I am, I'm really, really honored to have been part of your dissertation committee. It's a really good work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Serena. Thank you for that. 
and Dr. Heidi, Heidi. <laughs> Thank you, Audra. I was just, I'm so appreciative of just having the chance to be with you since the beginning. Like I remember that when you came to CIS, we kind of struck a chord with each other right away because we were both hailing from the East Coast and found our way to East West psychology. And, you know, to be uh, a part of your team and see you through this, you know, not only timely and relevant research, but something that, you know, not only validated what's out there in the literature, but really is a call to action in the end for higher education to lead the charge of change. And so, Yes, thank you so much for your research and for your commitment to the work. And I also want to acknowledge you as a person, like a leader in higher ed and a mother and doing this research. I think that dynamic makes it extra unique. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Um, yeah, Audra, I mean, from the minute we started working together, from the minute I met you, I was struck with uh, your commitment and your passion for social change, you know, from the minute I met you in Dean Shirley Strong's office, way <laughs> back in the day, right? And the, the work we did together around social justice at CIS, and then to come full circle and to be on your committee, you know, in this work that at its heart is this desire to change the world, to bring more equity, right? Mm -hmm. And um, my appreciation I, is about the timeliness of this work right now, uh, we're looking at women leaders nationally in the U.S. and how that is a topic that is really up, you know, with the, you know, presidential elections and what's going on, and and uh, on many levels, women of color in leadership positions on the rise. Um, and so I'm really appreciative that you are knocking on the door of academia and saying, "Where are you? Why aren't you there yet?" You know, not that we have arrived anywhere, but why aren't you joining? And this is how you can join. And I also want to, um, I also see this work. You interviewed women leaders. You are a woman leader in higher ed. And one of the contributions of being a woman leader in higher ed is to pay it forward. Mm -hmm. And so the women leaders that you interviewed are paying it forward through this work. Mm -hmm. And that is a very valuable contribution. They're demonstrating how to pay it forward with their generosity here. Mm -hmm. for the women in lower and mid leadership, you know, um, on the ladder, whatever you want to call it, right? That this is geared towards. So it is an effort of paying it forward. And um, the one other thing I want to really appreciate here is that I've taught leadership, I've taught women in leadership. When I'm putting together a syllabus, I'm looking for books and they're overwhelmingly overwhelmingly books that are dealing with like quantitative data mm -hmm. with kind of an overarching superficial um, uh, um, discourse, right? That's like, well, yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know that you ha you're not saying much, you know? And so what I really appreciated in your work is your desire to get to those intimate spaces, right? Yes, we know there's an equality, but now can you tell me, can you speak from your heart? You know, can you tell me what that feels like? And that comes across in your dissertation when you quote the woman that, you know, you didn't really bring here because of an anonymity or whatever, right? So I really appreciate that depth that, that is needed, you know, uh, because what comes across in intimate spaces could potentially be much more transformative and meaningful uh, for, uh, for developing our resilience right, for understanding bias and developing our resilience. So that's, I'm truly appreciative on all these levels, Audra. So thank you for this amazing work. Thank you so much. Yeah. And so for the next round, uh, we'll open it up now to questions and uh, discussion of the actual work. Um, and again, I would love to start with Dr. Serena um, and see if you have any questions for Audra or, um, something you'd like to discuss with her at this point? Yes, thank you. I, I'm grateful that you added that slide of your future step, possible future steps, because I think that this dissertation can open up so many 
possibilities. I also like very much the idea of the qualitative type of, of research that you did and also how your coaching persona, that's how I met you, comes into the interviewing, speaking from the heart, listening from, from the heart. Um, in one of the things that you say is that you would like to, uh, to, to publish a book. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that you use this research and the findings that you have uh, gathered. And I would also like to see an autoethnography oh. of yeah. your own work in higher education as a, as a leader and a, a woman leader in higher education. Um, would that be something that you would be interested in doing? Yes, totally. Um, I've started sort of dabbling in finding publishers that might be in alignment with the work. Um, I think it would be, you know, my my vision, what my heart says is that I want it to be something that's really um, more in the popular stream so that more women would have access to it and could read it. Um, and so I think there would be considerable work in taking the research I've done and then and writing it for a popular audience. Um, but uh, yes, totally. I, I feel inspired to do that. And I think, you know, I mentioned like a website and a quiz and courses that could be online. I think all of that could be, um, you know, its own little ecosystem. I just have to find the time to do it. <laughs> time to rest now. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Serena. Heidi, Dr. Heidi, your question. Thank, thank you. I was um, struck by one of the things that you shared, you know, recommendations for women, be well prepared. And it's less of a question, more just like having a conversation with you and everyone here. It's like, I think it's helpful to be prepared. And then maybe if you experience adversity and bias, you're, you're not so kind of bowled over and you don't feel alone, but I felt sad. Mm -hmm. that this is where we're at right now in the 21st century. Um, so maybe that's just a, a comment because it struck me so much in, in, in your recommendations. But I guess a question I had is like, how do we, how do we transform the systems and the culture in a way where, where maybe be prepared doesn't have to be a recommendation? And I guess this is our work, right? It's not gonna be answered at Audra's defense, but that's just what I've been thinking about. Um, yeah. Well, I think um, I touched on it when I talked about like untangling these things, right? So um, I can talk from a couple of different perspectives. One is personally, now that I know this, like even just in this last several weeks, I have had conversations with women um, from institutions or from my, in my life. Um, and, you know, people share with me, especially now they know I'm doing this research, but in general, they share with me things that they're up against. Um, and I've taken the opportunity to reflect back when I can to women um, that there, it, this is not just you that's experiencing this thing, right? Because when we are in the thick of it and we're in the everyday and we have to get up and do the thing and work the nine hours and you're on Zoom and it's like one after another, um, we're already tired, right? And then things happen and we really say, wow, did that, could that be that? Could that be, is this about me? Um, did I do something wrong? Why am I not being seen? Why am I not being heard? Um, I've told him over and over. Or I told my boss over and over. I've shared these things and yet I don't get the response I'm looking for. Um, so the first thing is, is to, you know, recognize, and I think part of the be well prepared is that this isn't just about you. Yes, there is your performance in a position within an institution or an organization, um, but let's just look one example is the performance and assessment structure that people have to go through. It's very rudimentary. It's like this rote process. Nobody looks forward to it. It's this little form you have to fill out every year. Um, and 
you know, that could, that one thing could be really just busted out and used as a tool for transformation in organizations that allows people to be seen and heard in the work that they're doing and then help them move forward. Um, one of the things that I'm struck by right now being in the CSU system and Dr. Serena was also in the CSU system. So um, maybe you saw this there, but there's a whole lot of bureaucracy in any organization there is, but when you're in a government or state um, backed system or organization, there's even more. And so the red tape is like, it's just, it's all over the place. Um, and I've heard from my own supervisors um, at Sonoma State, but also at other institutions, like that would be great if we could do it, but we can't because dot, 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 right? Um, I'm in a hiring process right now for my own team. And there's questions of like, well, can we incorporate this person in the pool? Well, the pool's closed. The interview's already happened, right? So there's things that we want to do to move things forward, but we have to be aware of this entangled system that is in place. And then who are we within that, right? Um, do our own personal work and process to manage ourselves emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally, so we can separate out our experience of adversity and grief from the work that we have to do, because they go both hand in hand. But if we're just focused on what's happening with me, and we're not looking at the overall system, um, or how we could impact it, there are moments where we could ask the right question to the right person, right? And sometimes those moments pass us by, sometimes things don't go the way we want to. And so then come back to locus of control. What can I do in this situation with all the knowledge that I have? Um, how can I influence this direction right now? It's not gonna be the be all end all, it's not gonna solve all the problems. Um, but maybe it will make it a little bit better for the next woman that's coming. Um, did I answer the question? I feel like I had something else to say, but I lost it. Yeah, it's an ongoing, I think, for all of us, right? But thank you for yeah. sharing, well, Audra. Yeah, I guess the other thing I did want to say is that it is ongoing um, and it can't just be from the personal perspective. It has to be from the administration. It has to be from the leaders of the institution making a commitment to anti-racist, anti-oppressive work, not just saying it, but making it happen and including people along the way. You can't just say, oh, I'm working on that. You need to ask them what their opinion is. All of the people across the institution Right. Right now, Sonoma State is up against like we've got budget cuts, strategy. How are we going to do this? What, how are we going to cut all this money but still preserve people's jobs? That's a time when I think they should be asking everyone. I have things to say about it for sure. Um, and I, I try to share that where I can. But um, why isn't it a more inclusive process? Why isn't it a more transparent conversation? Um, and part of it is just time. You know, it's, it's, this is really hard. It's a hard time right now specifically. Um, but, you know, when we're in the work of it and in the thick of it and we're all exhausted and everybody's trying to take care of their kids at home, um, to really step back and look at the whole system that you're in takes a lot of effort, but we have to do it. And the administrators and the top leaders of institution and the chancellors of systems have to be the ones that commit to that work. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi and Audra. Um, yeah, I want to go back to that word, you know, disentangle, right? Because you show a table of your findings, the, the four areas with the lists, you know, and to me, you know, if I look at one thing on that list, like sexism, yeah, okay, racism, yeah, okay. But when I look at them all together, there, there's power in that. You know, I think that's one of the contributions you make in this research there's power in bringing all these together for someone to say, oh, it is not just me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not unique here. Like I, I might be with a group of women and I might share one, like we're all women, but we come from different backgrounds. And I might say, but I'm also experiencing this that they're not experiencing, right? Yeah. So I can look at that table and say, oh, but other women have experienced it. So it, it kind of that comprehensive look uh, mm -hmm. is a contribution that you're making that allows us to begin to untangle, I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I, and that is highlighted in the actual dissertation. So I just wanted to bring that out um, to kind of honor your work. 
And what struck me, two things that really struck me from that list that I learned, right? Mm -hmm. um, one, th the first thing that struck me was uh, when uh, they connected self-care with not just exercise and nature, but with also my practice or my capacity to live with integrity to my own values. Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty profound, yeah. right? I thought that was pretty profound. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I kept reading for these, these jewels that came out of these interviews. That's really, so um, it's not just about this kind of external process. It's also a deeply internal process. Mm -hmm. And so as you're being prepared, it adds to that being prepared piece, be prepared to know who you are in all of this, because that is a way of self-care. It kind of all ties together when you look at it all together, right? Mm -hmm. Then the other word that struck me, and it made me sad too, Heidi, is we have self-care, and that's a great, beautiful word. But then the other concept of self-preservation Mm -hmm. That took me back, like, wow, to work in higher academia, I need to consider my self-preservation, mm -hmm. right? Is my life on the line here? Mm -hmm. You know, so that, for them to bring that up shows you the depth of feeling and the depth of the experience of bias mm -hmm. and adversity that they have encountered that they call it self-preservation. Yeah. So oh, I'm just pointing out the, some of the things that really spoke to me. This is more a reflection about mm -hmm. your work you know, and its significance. Mm -hmm. And so I'll ask you that same question because you are a woman in higher ed. These things really like, like spoke to me, pushed me out of my like slumber of sexism, racism, like, whoa, wait a minute, self-preservation, right? What, what, when you were in the interviews, did you encounter moments like that, that really kind of shook you out of the norm of mm -hmm. this conversation? Yeah. Um, so just to clarify, you're asking about my own self-preservation. Yeah. No, no, like what, what in your, in your, when you were listening, when you were yeah. reading, when you were analyzing these stories, yeah. how did you, you know, you, because you talked about them being also transformative, the whole experience, mm -hmm. right? How did that happen for you? And, and what shook you to your core? Like the word self-preservation shook me. Mm -hmm. Deeply, you know? Yeah. Um, there was a sense of self-preservation, I think, even in just how the participants shared their stories, right? There's this like quick nature of, well, here's something that happened to me. But when you go back and listen to that story, I mean, the things that shook me were um, women sitting next to old white guys saying, wow, I just can't even see you as my boss because you're such a woman, right? That's something that shook me. Um, listening to the stories of having to go cry by the river because there was a hate crime because of somebody's color of their skin, right? And that there was a hate crime on my campus when I was a leader and it's under my watch, right? How can that stuff still be happening? And how do I, how do I hold this for my community and stay solid in my integrity and leadership as I move forward? And, you know, leaders, there's this sense of expectation. You're not supposed to cry up there when you're, you're talking to your community, but we're still feeling emotion. So I can imagine that president, when they were a dean and had that hate crime happen, feeling emotion, but still having to stay almost stoic for their community to showcase that they're this like rock, right? I am a rock for you. Here's what we're going to do. This is how we're going to focus on our community. But inside, she just can't wait to get by the river to weep. So even just as I say those words, like it brings up emotion, you know, to hear their stories in the moment, I was going through waves of emotion and having to stay present for them. This is your space, your story. It's not about my emotion right now. It's not about my experience or my position or even my white guilt, right? It's not about that. It's about them and what they're saying and what their story is and things they've gone through. Um, so I really lean back on my coaching ability and skills and practice that you can stay present to your own emotion without experiencing it in the moment, right? Like even just now, wave of emotion, I could feel it rising up in my body. I'm gonna allow it to be there, but then 
deep breath, move forward, let's keep going through, but I'm going to have to go decompress again, right? And after every interview, I had to take that space to just like, be with this, what just was said, what did I hear, what are they going through, what are the things that are happening for them. And for my own personal journey, um, I don't say this out loud too many places, my husband likes to say it for me, but you know, I could see myself as a president of an institution someday. And one of the things that was really key about mentorship and sponsorship was this ability to shadow other women in their experience and in their role. And I was able to do that as a witness when I heard their stories and their trajectories and then listening to them say, you know, I was um, a first generation college student. I didn't even know what I was doing when I started. Uh, somebody saw the potential in me and, and told me. And that's when I started to see myself in that way. And then I carried through and the mentors and the people that supported me are the ones who really lifted me up and helped me to get to where I am. If you had asked me when I was in college, would I be a vice president or a pre president? No, not like all of them said no. Um, they didn't see themselves there, right? But it was that witnessing and being able to shadow others and see the potential of what they could be and what they could do that assisted them in putting your own shoe, feet in those shoes and, and then taking the steps forward to do that. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Audra. And uh, yeah, I mean, the power, the power of this dissertation or part of the power of this dissertation is these stories, because lest we think that we don't need to hear those stories again, or that somehow there is equity because, you know, some statistics says that things are getting better, you know? but it's really important and um, the healing like you just showed the transformation that can come in that kind of sharing which is part of your method you know so thank you thank you for that and for going there with that question dr serena any more another question or reflection or yes uh, i can see you as the president of a university I, as i was reading that dissertation i saw you there and I know it will happen if that's what your heart desires. And uh, in that self preserve when, when, when May, you mentioned um, self preservation and how I survived the web of bureaucracy of the CSU, I, I just left as soon as I could. I took an early retirement because it was too much for me. I didn't want to fight it anymore. And I am wondering, in your own academic career, um, how can I ask this? What would be the next strategic steps to follow your heart and your intuition into fulfilling that dream? What would be the most strategic priorities for you to step into? Um, in your career? Um, well, you know, right as we got on and you asked it, are you still in that position? And I said, nope, I moved into this new position. My new boss was here for a while. Um, one of the strategic things that I've recently done is see that I was in a position that was boxed in. I was a coordinator basically performing the role of a director. And I have done that at three institutions as a woman in higher education, continuing to work at a level that isn't being rewarded by title or salary and, and the potential that I could be delivering, right? Um, some of that might be me going above and beyond the position requirements, of course. Um, and we all have to navigate that when we're in positions and wanna go to the next one. Um, but I think strategically, because I'm here in Sonoma County, you know, we own a home, we're committed to being here for a period of time, and we don't know how long that will be. But, you know, Sonoma State is the institution for me right now in my life. And so this opportunity came open to, to apply for a director role. And I did that, even though it wasn't in line with the, the previous work that I had done completely, right? Um, it was a new thing, a new step, a new direction um, that I'm having to navigate. And 
that was a strategy for me, right? To say, I know that if I want to continue in my career at this juncture, I really need certain key things on my resume and in my professional experience. I need to oversee much larger budgets, right? So now I oversee grants that are quarter million dollars a year, five million dollars almost all together between three programs. Um, so it's like, taking that step up in really functional skills around finance and administration. So that's one thing, but also overseeing more of a staff, being able to hire, bring people on, oversee their performance evaluations, and hopefully bring in some of what I talked about into their experience um, and, and fill in the, sh the next shoes before I go to the big ones, right? We've got to take incremental steps to get there. So that's part of my strategy. Um, so I'll continue to do that as opportunities present themselves, consider and weigh the options of what I'm going to do next. And that might that might be moving to a different institution at some point to be able to pursue um, you know, a, a type of position or a type of organization that I want to be with. But you always have to consider the personal. And you know, right now my life is here, my daughter is 16 months old. Um, we're not moving anytime soon and um, we'd like to have another child and so part of my strategy is recognizing that too, that um, the balance in my life is pursuing my family and my children and my husband and, and our relationship and our family and creating that um, and not believing that it doesn't have to hold me back, that it can be part of the beauty and, and balance of my life. Um, and knowing that at some points I'm going to have to make decisions and I might not always be there for everything. You know, the, my participants talked about um, having to be on the road and bringing the same book with them that their kid had at home so they could read it to them at night, stepping out of dinner meetings so they could be on the phone or a video with their kids before they go to bed. Um, so I have to face whether or not I want that to be a reality in the lives of my children. So we'll take it one day at a time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Audra. Heidi, another question or? Yeah, sure. Well, first, before I forget, I want to congratulate you on your first teaching appointment this coming fall. I was like, <laughs> the question I had was, um, you know, how, how do you see the, 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 the theoretical frame acted out in practice in your own work that, that you, that you applied to your research? And, and, you know, maybe a follow-up to that is like, if you have any initial visions on like those programs that you're thinking about launching I'd love to hear and it's just like imagining in together no no big pressure like you need the answers right now yeah um well sometimes it's hard to put theory to practice and I think you know I've said like taking incremental steps I think in that same vein when we're working with people and human beings right we've all got things going on you know I might have something that I'm thinking about for someone I oversee their work and and they come to me and say well this is what's going on in my personal life right okay pause that let's go back you're human first what's going on then how does that impact your work and your performance what can we do to manage and navigate that um, so it's changes is, is a real process and it has to be a slow process to some degree some things can happen more quickly and often that happens with policy and procedure change when the system changes and then something aids everyone in the system to actually make that change right we're going to start to address this thing there's a new form it's on the website here's how you access it so um, I think from an organizational perspective, I only have a certain uh, locus of control right now, right, in my current position. And I see things that could be happening. And it's like, well, should I say that to somebody or who could I talk to about it? Um, and some of those things I share, you know, I meet uh, with the vice president semi-regularly. And so sometimes I'll share my feedback. Um, specifically, my vice president was able to introduce me to some people for this study. And so he's followed my work and I've, he asked me to present for the division. So I did that. Um, so I'll continue to try to do those things. Um, but, you know, even in, in that relationship, there's the navigation of, 
I'm a woman, he's a man, he's a man of color, I'm a, I'm a white woman, I'm in this system, I see other women of color who are up against things that are even um, you know, more difficult than the one I'm up against. And I have had this opportunity. I was able to step into a director role where other people haven't been. Um, so just sort of holding all of that, right. And knowing it's not all going to happen all at once or overnight. Um, and if at all, like some things will not change, right. Or I won't be able to change them per se. Um, so, I think when I think about bringing these lenses, it's gonna be in my personal work first. And then as a supervisor and director of the area that I oversee, and as I continue to add more to my work, um, hopefully that can sort of take place over time. Um, and then bring these things up in committees when policies are being discussed, you know, is this inclusive? Are we really, um, looking at it from an equity perspective, what do we mean by that right now with this thing that's on the table? Um, yeah, so I think it'll continue to be a thread for me as I go forward. And sometimes it will be formal and sometimes it will be informal. Thanks, Audra. I was also thinking maybe it's a certificate program at CIIS. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Audra, what I'm really appreciating is, you know, there's the scholarship and the dissertation, but then there's your immense practical knowledge in the field, you know, and how you're bringing those two together. I mean, it's one thing to sit behind the desk and idealize about what it could be. It's another thing to know the realities of what you're facing in the field, you mm -hmm. know, and to bring those together is a strength that I think you, you have because you are in both places. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my question, that I was also thinking about throughout is so we so um, we get women women into leadership positions mm -hmm. in higher end. You are completely successful, right? How will that change the terrain of academia and the ivory tower? And again, yeah. this is imagining imagining with us. What after you know? What do you think? Well, how could that change it? Yeah. Well, first of all, there are women in positions of leadership in higher education, and we still see that the system is entangled, right? <laughs> um, so it's not enough to take a position, say the opportunity is open, we've hired a woman, um, and in some cases, specifically, women of color are sought out for particular positions, right? That doesn't mean that the system they're within has changed, or that they will be able to change it. So how do we actually shift this? It's got to be a collective, like we all take stock and look at this together and start to untangle it. Um, and it has to be a priority of the institution itself that everybody can jump on board in some way um, and take action, right? It's sort of like looking at um, climate change, right? Like we all know this is a thing that's happening. Um, yet we're not all sure how to do it. And there has to be ways for people to engage um, and beyond like recycling, right? Like we know that's not gonna be enough. So if we just put the, the woman in, in the seat, it isn't gonna be enough to actually disentangle all of this. Um, so, you know, even if we reached gender parity and 50% of presidents were women in higher education by 2030, we're probably still looking at a long road, right? It's, I heard the other day that it's something like, you know, 208 years until we find gender parity nationally and politically, right? When we look at all things involved, like even our Congress, it'll take us like 60 years to reach gender parity. So there's a long road and especially in institutions of higher education that are state are funded, um, politics plays a great part in that, you know, there are policies that have to change at the national and state level in order to impact what is experienced at institutions. I'm really even more aware of that right now, now in my new position overseeing upward bound programs that are funded by the US Department of Education. There are certain things you can do and certain things you can't, right? And then these programs are in schools and they're with principals that are trying to make change 
um, they want to do certain things and they see that this program is great, but it has to be inclusive, but the program is exclusive and the money has to be paid for these students. So, you know, the intricacies of that over time, I mean, we just, we have a really long road to go and we have other huge critical crises that are going on, not just in and without higher education, right? Like just this past week, we had a hate crime happen on our campus, people Zoom bombing in on meetings, right? So when that comes up, that's what we have to deal with. Everything else goes to the wayside for these few hours of the day or whatever it might be, because we have to continue to address these critical national and, and international global problems. Thank you. Thank you, Audra. And this is where I think, you know, going circling back to Heidi's question about the feminist, eco-feminist and transformative leadership piece mm -hmm. is um, this dissertation is not about just placing women instead of men at the higher level of highest level of academia. It really is about a whole systems change, you know, for the greater good, for whatever that means. And uh, and the burden, because I mean, it's going to fail if that's what our expectation is, because to expect women without the support that's needed to make these changes is, is, a, is a formula for disaster. Right. Women will fail. No more women will be presidents because, you know, they're not like there's no magic where you put a woman in that office and all the mess of society is going to funnel through that woman and come out, come out beautifully. Right. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. So right. and um, how long is she going to last when all of that right. is up against and so this is where that trifecta that you developed, I think, can be incredibly useful, mm -hmm. um, you know, because we are talking about transformation. We are talking about eco-feminism, feminism and eco-feminism and the sort of more expansive and interconnected picture that that brings, you know, to all living kind. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. Wow. Great conversation. Um, Heidi and Serena, Serena, any more questions or are you ready to um, to go into a breakout session and um, sort of discuss next steps? Yes. The only last question I had is, when are you gonna share your recommendations with SSU? <laughs> well, the <laughs> vice president was supposed to be here today but had to um, bow out for something. Um, but he's already seen my work. And so well, I have a meeting with him at the end of March where I'll be able to share a little bit more and then, um, you know, go through the chain of command, request a meeting with the president. Would that be okay? Can you make that introduction, that kind of thing? And hopefully sit down and talk with her um, as well at some point in the next year, uh, if that's possible. So that's how I kind of will approach it. Yeah, awesome. Good. So, um, Stephen, if you can put us in a breakout room and then uh, Audra, you can just facilitate an ongoing questions, conversation, reflections. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. <laughs> so just take a moment. We're going to be zapped somewhere else. <laughs> So anybody could jump in if you have questions, feel free to while we're waiting for them to break out. I don't have a question, but I, I do have a comment. I just want to say how delightful it is to see the progress of this um, project over time and to really see you embody the values and, um, <clears throat> and articulate so clearly the strengths that you're espousing uh, that other women leaders in academia can have. I, I really look forward to seeing uh, how it unfolds over time, Audra, and I think um, it's a splendid contribution. Thank you, Sasha. Thanks for being here. Hey, Audra, I want to just congratulate you. Um, yeah. Sasha, yeah, I would just echo everything that you said. Um, I, I also just, you know, want to recognize, you know, as I came on to Zoom, I was thinking about Oh yeah, like our very first conversation at Harbin, you know, when we, we were at Harbin Extension, right? Mm -hmm. At the retreat, our, literally our very first conversation was almost this, you know, like- okay. I'm glad you're you know, your, your future that for me. seeing, your visioning of yourself, where you would be. And I remember you were asking like very like pointed questions, like, so Ishtar, how do I, how do I get to where, you know, like, it's like, this is where you were going. This is where you wanted to go. The whole 
um, the whole journey, like, and I think you knew it, you know, like you were visioning and sort of like what May was saying that the way you held the narrative structure of your co-participants was through the heart, you know, and I just, I really feel that on, on such a great level. So thank you. Thank you so much for this work. I'm, I'm really, I'm so proud of you, Audra. I, I, it's, it's a little weird to say proud of you. No, but, it's not. You know, I, there's got to be another way of saying that. I so appreciate what you've done. Um, and it, it is very indicative of literally the first day of you walking into CIS and saying, this is where I'm going, you know, and I think there's a, there's a great amount of, um, th there's a great amount of importance to believe in oneself. So my question to you mm -hmm. is how, you know, of the, of the eight women that you, you know, held, you know, that you held interviews with, I'm really curious about the level of internalized oppression, right? The level mm -hmm. of imposter yeah. syndrome, you know, mm -hmm. how women in academia feel like they don't belong. So then they work harder. They end up carrying the emotional burden because they're women, because it's natural mm -hmm. for them, right? And then um, they burn out or yeah. they, they just, they're not recognized and how that is totally invisibilized, right? Mm -hmm. That there's this, there's this, um, I don't know if you've read um, Carol Pearson's book, Mapping the Organizational Psyche. It's a great depth psychologist book around uh, what the organizational psyche looks like from a depth psychological perspective, where you can't name the things that you feel in your gut. Like, like you were saying, you know, the energy rises, you feel the emotion, you feel it, but everybody else is going to deny it. So I'm very curious about that element that came up in your interviews, if if, if any, I, I imagine there was a lot of that. So can you yeah. speak to that without disclosing anyone or? Yeah, um, I mean, I think, you know, when I touched on trauma, that's kind of what I, where I was going to is that um, they all held internalized oppression. And one of the ways that they specifically dealt with that was to brush things off right? Like this isn't happening. I'm not a victim in this situation. Let's refocus on the students and what they need, right? So I can cry by the river because my student experienced that. But when things happen to me or my colleagues or I'm seeing things happen, um, I don't know that they actually address it. And I think they do internalize a majority of it and um, may not fully see the systemic oppression that they are are part and parcel to that they are within that is continuously impacting them, um, but they bear the brunt of it. They they hold that burden, and you know what happens is they get sick. Things happen, injuries, illnesses. Um, one woman specifically did talk to me about this. Um, she specifically was Latina and that identity place was really important for her in her journey. She felt like even though she had reached, you know, significant um, positions of leadership within the faculty and leading others and making change in the institution, she was just constantly silenced. Um, she didn't feel seen. Um, she felt like she was given a position to shut her up and then constantly had take things taken away from her, whether it was money or influence or committee positions. Um, you know, so it, for her, she knew that it was internalized, but she also did to some degree try to process that within the organization. Um, but there was not a compassionate place for that to land. So she had to recognize like, this is affecting me. I'm now having health concerns because of this. I can no longer go at this pace. I can no longer hold these things. I can no longer try to change the whole institution. Um, sometimes, some ways maybe, but um, I have to take a step back, take more vacations, go for more walks, dance, travel. Um, have joy and pleasure, you know, let's not even talk about pleasure. That's a whole nother thing, right? When we talk about internalized depression, um, emotion is silenced and self-silenced, but pleasure is like, that's, you know, not even something we have permission to touch on, right? Um, so yes, yes, yes. That is one of the things that could be a whole nother study based on this data set and what I've learned. Um, I think there could have been more specific questions around that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, when I said a center for women in leadership, that's kind of the like 
layman's terms, but it would probably need to be a center for something that focused on this trifecta and really looked at the oppression that women are holding and carrying. The other thing is, is that there are a lot of affinity groups. This is my current experience. I know it's different at other institutions um, for different people based on their backgrounds, right? Like Asian Pacific Islander, Black African American, Latina, Latinx, um, women of color, uh, men of color, Black men, and all of these things are necessary to continue to combat racism and oppression. Um, but where do the other women fall, right? If you don't feel like you connect to one of those affinity groups, um, there's still oppression happening for other people within the institution and they don't have a place to be. And I imagine that happens every at every institution for some person or some group that's underrepresented. I can imagine that it happens for the trans community for sure, right? They are some of the people that are experiencing those hate crimes. And when your intersectionality includes like being a black trans woman, um, for example, it's like the, the you know, somebody else asked a question in the, the chat privately about the transgender community and non-binary community. So I wanted to address this too. Um, all of this work can impact the experiences that they're having. But if we're going to really truly disentangle the systems and structures in our institutions, we have to look at each and every group. What do Black and African American people experience on our campus and in our community? How do we see that bias and adversity that they're up against? How do they see it? How do they describe it? Where are they finding it? Where are they not finding it? Right? And then have them in the conversation of how we're going to change that. Um, and that has to be for all people who are experiencing bias. And that's that's a long journey. It's a lot of work to do all of that. And there's not a lot of space for it. So how do we carve out the space to address our internalized oppression, address how we might be personally persisting the oppression we're up against because we're not seeing it or brushing it off, um, and then look at it from the organizational lens as well? Did I answer your question? Oh yeah, and more. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Audrey. Congratulations. Thank you for being here. Another one of my midwives in the in the journey. <laughs> Audra, this is Devin. Can I jump in? Yeah. Hi. Hi. I'm going to try to be quick. I have two points. Um, first of all, congratulations. I was close to tears many, many times. My first point's around the relational aspect of how you approach this work. And my second point's around incrementalism. Mm -hmm. The first point is, um, you know, I worked in a higher education office for you 11 years ago, mm -hmm. and I got to experience firsthand how you approach the amazingness of your work and community and belonging and inclusion and experiential education and learning through a relational lens. And I think that that is very apparent in the qualitative approach that you've taken here. And I just love that thread throughout your career. And I'm excited to see how that develops in the future. Um, my second point is around incrementalism. And I, I love, you know, cause I op also operate in the systems, individual and collective change world and I, I want to push back on this idea of incrementalism being okay, because I think that it is to some degree a white dominant narrative that we're telling ourselves. And I, I think it's the narrative of, you know, can we move slowly and make change better systemically or individually at a slower pace? And yes, that can be okay, but I push back on, you know, and I want to hear more from you on who's defining for whom that incrementalism, if it's for yourself, or if it's for others, or if it's ourselves for ourselves, um, just challenging that notion. And again, I just think that you are the bee's knees. So congrats. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely want to address that. Um, I think that, you know, I'm going to start from personal and then go outward. First, like as a professional and a person, I only have so much capacity in a day. And now that I have a child, I can see that, you know, if I'm holding this burden in my work, I'm holding it for others. I'm seeing, you know, just in the past several weeks in this new position, 
I have students in Lake County that are in my programs that have experienced hate crimes during COVID. Being a black student in a primarily white, um, primarily uh, Republican or conservative area, um, being you know experiencing those things on a day to day. So that's going to impact that person, but it also impacts all the people around them that want to be able to do something, but the system doesn't allow for something to be done right away, right? And when you say, you know, that it can be a white dominant um, narrative, sure it is, but that's also because, you know, most of these positions of leadership are still dominated by white individuals. And so if you consider being a teacher in a school where that happened, and there are other um, professionals who, you know, are much more conservative to the point of allowing racial slurs in their classroom, for example, without addressing the students that are, are making those slurs. This is just one, one example. Um, if you're the person that's non-dominant and you consider going up against that, you're, you're actually putting your job and your life on the line, right? Because you might be silenced and pushed out of that organization. And depending on your community, you might be pushed out of your community. You might not be allowed to get another job, especially if you're a woman of color. Or if you get another job, it might not be high paying, so you might not be able to survive, then you have to get two jobs, right? So the things go on and on. Um, so when I say incremental, I don't take that lightly, and it's not that I haven't thought through that. Um, and then when I look at it personally, like I know that I have a position of influence, and yet how, what's my strategy going to be to try to move that community in a new direction <clears throat> when I only have so much power and privilege there? Um, but I do have some, right? And so what's my strategy going to be? How am I going to approach it? And if I come from a relational perspective, I have to understand who are the people there? Who's the principal? Who's the superintendent? Who are these teachers? How is it going to impact the manager that I oversee? Um, and all of that relationality takes time, right? So one of the things that is a challenge about moving up in higher education is that when you move around from position to position, then you're not really rooted in the communities that you're impacting, you're rooted in this overall organization. Um, and so I see that the work I can do could be different if I was more rooted deeply into one community for the long term. And I think we need to look at that perspective community wide, right? So when we look at county systems, states, cities, we need those people who are going to be there for the long haul and stay. Um, and then there's, you know, positionality is different, right? So Devin, your position being, you know, in the world of consulting and design and making change and justice through organizations, you might have an easier time coming into my organization and telling them, wait, we can't do this incrementally. Your people are suffering. We have to change it now. And here's how we're going to do it. You might have an easier time than I would within the organization to do that because I'm locked into the system. Um, and yes, do we see this system clearly all the time, every day? No, you know, sometimes I'm tired. I didn't sleep last night. My baby was screaming in the middle of the night. Um, and, uh, you know, I haven't mentioned this and we don't normally in, in an organizational setting, but where am I in my cycle as a woman? How is that impacting me? Where am I in my fertility journey? How is that impacting me? Um, where are we ter in terms of what's happening in the world, right? The, the eco crisis, the race climate crisis, the political crisis, all of these things impact people emotionally and physically. Where are they in their bodies in this day? You know, are they struggling with depression and anxiety? Um, comfort eating right here, right? Like things that we have to just navigate on a day-to-day -day basis. So when I say incremental, there are things we can do to shift things on a dime. There are thing, other things that will have to be incremental. It has to be both and, and we have to look from a systems perspective. When we look from a systems perspective, there are things that can happen on a, a bigger scale that could move more quickly and other things that come from a relational scale that might have to move more slowly. And so you and I, as two of these people, would be great partners, right? And we need more of those inter-industry, interdisciplinary partnerships to happen to make this all move forward, I think. I'm glad we came in when we did and heard you say all that, Audra. That was amazing. <laughs> Great. Hi. Welcome back. <laughs> and that's what we were talking about when we were in our little private room is when is your autobiography coming out because of how much came out in this defense around your 
practical strategic knowledge of how this can happen as you were just demonstrating right now and so um we conferred and your committee agrees that you have done a phenomenal job here today and we would like to pass you uh with no revisions for this defense and we would like Woo! to welcome you as dr audra grady verrier and um, just really want to stop here and congratulate you um, with all my heart for the hard work you've done and for reaching this, you know, milestone. Congratulations, Audra. Thank you so much. Woo! Next step. You and I will, not right now, you and I will meet this next week and we'll talk about next steps, the draft, where it's at and paperwork and all that. But for now, congratulations. Thank you so much. Good job. Well done. Amazing. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. And I'll open it to the committee to congratulate <laughs> or if they have last words. So proud. Yeah. Yeah. So proud of you, Dr. Audra. So happy to have been part of this um, wonderful work. And this presentation was really the beautiful culmination of your expertise and your life experience. and. And that's why I support what Dr. May said about your autoethnography. This needs to be known and disseminated because you, you're an amazingly brilliant scholar, but you have all also been in the trenches and you know what you're talking about and that needs to be known. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for your chats and private messages too. Dr. Audra, take it in. <laughs> yeah, I had another emotional swell happening. <laughs> Let it out. Revisions, what a relief. Woof. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> well earned. So, Audra. Mm -hmm. How does it feel, Doctor? Doctor, what will you, Doctor Audra Grady Verrier, or who will you be? I have many people at defenses like Adiba became Doctor D right away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I said this recently because um, my students often call me Miss Audra. Some mm -hmm. it just keeps happening over and over. So I think it might be Mrs. V or Doctor V, right? Something like that. I don't know. We'll see what comes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I accept doctor and will work hard to uphold that in my life and my work. And um, I hadn't really thought about my book being autobiographical or ethnographical. Um, I thought about it maybe like sprinkling in some stories here and there. Um, so this is a new idea that I need to really um, sit with and be with and hold and see how it's going to come to fruition. And um, you know, how I navigate all this change I'm trying to make in an organization at the same time as writing a book again. Um, it so really came across in this presentation, uh, how much you have to offer as an autobiography, just from every question was answered from that place of experience that you have, you know, and so these are, this is very valuable to kind of put down uh, as you pay it forward, as you mentor, as you, as uh, you create community for, for other women that are seeking not to be the one and only in these experiences, you know? So yeah. um, it really came across. Thank you for that. Well, thank you for reflecting yeah. it to me. So the members. <laughs> open for anybody to congratulate Audra. This is where Zoom does not quite work. It works to bring a lot of people together, but at the end of something so huge, it's kind of <laughs> like, how do you, how do you, um, maintain or the energy or um, express the excitement in these little boxes. Change well, one way you could do it is everybody on mute. Everybody on mute, yeah. Change <laughs> your name, change your <laughs> name. Congratulations. Congratulations, Congratulations. So proud of you. Thank you. So proud of you. Feeling inspired. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> thank you everybody i want to acknowledge that you brought a, a human being into the world through this process at the same time that you achieved this it's so remarkable <laughs> well done, Audra. 
in the middle, yes. of, in the middle of a fire. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And in the middle of a pandemic, like all the things. <laughs> yeah, I love the first day when we entered. You know, I have a friend who's uh, an ED of a nonprofit. We can see you change. <laughs> delay. Somebody else. Anyway, Audrey, and she called me and she said, I had a staff meeting today and I started by telling everybody I'm on my moon and all the men wanted to leave. And, and she said, but I wanted to say that because half the population bleeds regularly. Why am I hiding that? You know, <laughs> thank you for saying that. I really appreciated you saying that right now. I just heard that. <laughs> it was not walked, planned. But... Walked into a meeting and said, excuse me, I'm on my moon. So just relax, everyone. Mm -hmm. And yeah. <laughs> Virginia is going to write about that in her dissertation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all for being here today, for Audra, for witnessing um, this sort of rite of passage, if you will. Um, and um, I'm extremely excited to have been part of this and honored to have been part of this. And uh, I will continue to work with Audra throughout the semester to get the technical edits and the paperwork and all, all these other things done, you know, the administrative stuff done. And um, yeah, I'm, it's nice to have been here with all of you. And um, congratulations again, Audra. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to recognize all the people that are here. I mean, I, I know I said thank you, but um, I have people in boats and cars and tents all across the world. I noticed Mylin came in from Australia. Um, it's just amazing to have this community of support. You are my village and have been with me all along the way. I really, in so many ways in my life, wouldn't have made, made it without all of you. Yeah. And, and I have done so much work on my own too. I recognize that you're all gonna write me and be like, well, you did this. <laughs> I did, but we do this in relationship and in community, you know? Um, so thank you all for the part that you play um, in my life and in my work and continuing to push me to be my better and best self. Um, I appreciate each of you. And thanks, Mom, yeah. for showing up from Maine. She's in the hospital she works at right now. <laughs> Maybe I can pull my mask off. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Serena and uh, for your contributions as a guest of CIA yesterday, as someone from outside the Institute. Thank you so much, you know, for- My, my, my pleasure. Your work here. And of course, Heidi, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Always also for all you contributed. And I say Heidi, Dr. Heidi, because it's- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you both so much, yeah.